We are happy to have you all here. Uh, today we have a really special guest that we are super excited. Um, Chris, uh, Dr. Yan, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Dr. Chris Yan. I work as a clinical fellow in acute medicine at the Southwest Acute Hospital, uh, soon to, to be a clinical fellow in neurology at Aden Brooks. And um, I, I, I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago. So I've only been in the UK for the past year uh, with the goal of becoming a neurologist. Yeah. Awesome, Chris, we're super excited to have you here. Um, this was very um, last minute and the, uh, yesterday I think was chaotic, but we are very honored to have you here. And I'm very, I'm personally very happy we uh, managed to get you here. Um, we've been doing, this is our fourth uh, international programs global virtual morning report. I know it's a big title. Um, and the purpose of having these meetings is getting to know people from all over the world, how they practice medicine and how their culture, their geography, their language impacts their clinical reasoning. Um, and I was telling everybody um, before we started the meeting that Northern Ireland is a part of the world where I know uh, I know very little of. Um, so very excited to expand a little bit about my perspective in that point. And um, yeah, I, I won't I won't throw any details of the case, um, but I'm also very excited about that too. Um, yeah, Ravi will be facilitating. Ravi, do you want to say hi? You know, it's, it's always so hard for me to figure out if somebody's saying Rabi or Ravi, but I, I took my cue from the from the world word facilitation. It's so funny. They're spelled so differently, but they sound so much alike. Um, yeah, I, I'm thrilled to be here. And I, uh, I, I just want to acknowledge the incredible efforts of the team to make today happen. Um, and the, the I only hear the surface of it. So I'm very grateful to Maria and Deborah and Ravi. Not me, not myself, for all the work they did to make it happen. And thrilled to have you here, uh, Chris. I know, um, I know you have direct or indirect connections with Ravi, so I'll let him say a hello and uh, shed light on on those before we jump in. Sure. Hi, I'm I'm Ravi. Um, I was contacted by uh, Chris's uh, colleagues, uh, Shiva, and I understand that you started a morning report uh, at your institution. It's the um, Southwest Acute Hospital, where you're currently a neurology fellow. And um, I thought it'd be a great idea. I was trying to look for programs in the British Isles, England, and uh, Shiva reached out and he's a big CPS fan. And then I just got talking with him and uh, he wanted to actually come on. And I also heard that we were gonna have Australian uh, part of this, this uh, VMR today, but unfortunately they were inviting Professor Gates from uh, Chris, you, where, where in Australia is Professor Gates? He's, he's from Geelong, Australia. Okay, so unfortunately we weren't able to coordinate, but this would have been a truly international global VMR with uh, Australia also joining, but maybe another time. But uh, I really, really uh, appreciate Chris coming on today and uh, bringing a case. And also at the end, we're gonna ask some questions about how you ended up from Trinidad and Tobago in, in, into a small or transplanted into a small town in Ireland, which is Eskillian, I believe. And Eskillian. And Eskillian. Sure. Sounds good. This is absolutely incredible. I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. And the way we go about the case is we have you present it, and then we have the entire audience participate. And I see a lot of familiar faces whose voices I uh, look forward to hearing. And as we go through the case, we'll try to get to know you and how you deliver care and what, uh, throughout. So um, we'll take over the whiteboard and have you jump right in and excited to get to know you, get to know where you practice and uh, hear the voices sure. of everyone who's here. Sure. Uh, so I'll just uh, share my screen. I think Chris has a couple of slides prepared. So if you want to go yeah. ahead, I'll post. you can share your screen and... Uh... We'll, sure. we'll do something with the whiteboard. <laughs> All right, can anybody, everybody see? I'm, 
Uh, this is so fascinating that um, you're taking us into neurology today, given your interest. I'm, I'm excited and nervous at the same time. No, no, it, it's a, a learning curve for everybody. I, 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 I would probably not know, uh, or know very little about yeah. many other things in medicine. It's always <laughs> a learning process. 100% wise words. All right. Yeah. All right. So, uh, well, I just tweaked the, the title a little bit to not give away too much. So it, it may sound a little bit bland, but sort of on the fly. But it was quite an interesting case that I, I picked up in Trinidad back in 2020. Mm. So without further ado. So the objectives that we would like to cover today would be to gain a basic and practical knowledge of clinically important brainstem neuroanatomy. Using Peter Gates's rule of four to simplify localization of the brainstem lesions and work through a clinical case using our simplified model to deduce where the lesion is. So as you can see, the brainstem is a very complex structure. It's cramped, it's rather small, but there are a lot of off tracks going in many different directions here and there with various anatomical structures with even more functions. So there's no, no, no two ways about that. This is what I imagine a neurologist might look like trying to localize where a lesion is. And then there's me. So we'll start by a summary of the cranial nerves. So with cranial nerve one, we have the olfactory nerve responsible for smell. Cranial nerve two would be the optic nerve for sight. Three, four, and six is grouped together, responsible for the muscles of ocular movement, with three also being responsible for innervating the eyelid as well, and muscles of pupillary constriction. Cranial nerve five, which is rather large, it has a motor and sensory component, the motor being innervating the muscles of mastication and the sensory being the facial the sens sensation. Cranial nerve seven is the muscles of facial expression with a branch to the, the anterior two third of the tongue via the quarter tympani providing a sense of taste. Cranial nerve eight for balance, vestibular cochlea for balance and hearing. Nine for swallowing and the posterior wanted of the tongue taste. And cranial nerve 10, which is my favorite cranial nerve, the vagus nerve. And vagus in Latin means wanderer. And it, 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 the reason for this is that it wanders throughout the body after leaving the brainstem, innervating many different visceral organs, providing a vital function. Cranial nerve 11, or the spinal accessory nerve which innervate the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius, and cranial nerve 12, which innervate the muscles of tongue movement. Chris, you have to tell oh, us. Oh, Keith. Yes, yeah, sorry. You. you have to tell us, though, what your favorite cranial nerve is. The chat is, 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 um, is vending their opinions. What's your favorite cranial nerve? Uh, it's, the, it's the vagus. The vagus, why? Yes. Because... It, it, it well apart from being it, it, it's it's known as it, vagus means wanderer mm. and so you get terms like vagabond or vagrant from the latin okay. yeah wow and and it, it, it this the, the it, it leaves the brainstem and it's quite poetic really because and it innovates many of the the uh, touches the, the the other structures and provides yeah. a very vital function it's sort of like um how you would imagine going through life, wandering through, meeting various people, doing various wow. things, and, and being a positive influence way of you go. Well, there's some controversy in the chat. I'll summarize it. Maria says her cranial nerve is seven. Favorite. Ravi says it's two, and Maria um, uh, factually corrects him and says he's wrong. And Tiago, the epic philosopher, is like, actually, I'd like to know them a little bit better before I commit to a specific <laughs> Um, and my dear friend Rob Weber pokes everybody by saying that he likes cranial nerve 11, the most useless cranial nerve, um, <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. Well, yeah. We, I, we I'll, get, uh, I'll actually be touching a little bit. Of, oh, no. <laughs> all, so. oh. all right, my friend, we'll hand the mic over to you to tell us about the case. Yeah, yeah, sure. So our case, basically, he was a 50... 
a 50-year-old gentleman with a background of essential hypertension who presented with sudden onset. He was actually driving when this happened of left-sided facial weakness, horizontal diplopia, and right-sided hemiplegia. I have a video of the cranial nerve exam. So you, you guys can have a look at it and uh, see what you think. One second. I'll just put it from here. Okay. Can everybody see? Would anybody like to point out the abnormalities in that exam? I love the uh, um, I love the um, the text along with the video. That makes it really really helpful. You know, Chris, I will actually poke our favorite uh, one of our favorite neurologists, future neurologists in the house. Maria just turned her video off, so I suspect she stepped away. Vale, are you in a place where you can unmute and share what you thought? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Gabrielle, go for it, my friend. What did you see? Yeah, I, I'm not very proud, not really. So I'm trying in this one. Um, so basically, when they do in the, the facial expression, you, you can see that on the left side, the patient cannot smile and had a uh, had problem when uh, closing the eyes. So I'm thinking about a left, left uh, seven cranial nerve peripheral paralysis. And uh, when you're doing the, the deviation of the eye test, so you can see that the patient cannot look in the left side. So that points that the seven cranial nerve of that side, meaning the left cranial, uh, seven, uh, sorry, the six cranial nerve is um, damaged. So also the, the, seven, the six cranial nerve too. That's very good. Um, so the interesting thing about this case is that you would look at what, what, what you saw was basically a lower left cranial nerve seven palsy in combination with a left horizontal conjugate gaze problem. So if it, if it was just cranial nerve six in isolation on the left side, then the right eye should have been able to adduct as well, creating diplopia but both of his eyes could not move in the left direction. And we will see why that is short in a short bit. So, Chris, that's so, so helpful. Thank you for interpreting that. So it sounds like you're saying that um, he definitely had a left-sided cranial nerve seven. And yes. the reason we're saying it's, um, I mean, I think that if, do you mind reflecting briefly on how you, how one could come to the conclusion that it's, um, Lower versus upper. Yes. Yes. Is a uh, frontalis sparing. So in in an upper motor neuron seven lesion, you, there would normally be sparing of the frontalis. So as for instance, if I look up both my 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 face wrinkles looking up on both sides, 
However, in a lower motor neuron lesion, this does not happen, such as a Bell's palsy, for example. They, 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 there's no frontalis sparing, and that differentiates between the upper and the lower. Now, in this case, you might think that, well, well, hang on, this is a sudden onset problem, so this might be vascular, but then why is it lower? And uh, I'll show you, I'll demonstrate the reasoning I used to the, interpret this case um, on, on our morning ward round where there was much discussion back in Trinidad about it. Incredible. So, Maybe before you tell us more about the case, it's, and I know we'll dive deep into neurology, do you mind shedding some context into what the medical life like there in Trinidad? So when you saw this patient, where were you working and uh, what kind oh, of things were you seeing? At, at that time, I was at, at a registrar in internal medicine. The problem is that in internal medicine, there, we, do, we don't have, in that, especially in that hospital, which was relatively rural, we, do, we did not have a, a subspecialty cover. So as an, intern, an internist, you need to manage mm. the patients that come in with a myocardial infarction, patients that come in with an exacerbation of COPD, the patients that come in with a, a venomous viper bite, <laughs> the, yeah, the, the patients that, that come in with strokes, yeah. um, there's no stroke team. Uh, the, it, sometimes you would have had to dialyze a patient in the middle of the night because they're end stage renal disease and have a, an indication for acute hemodialysis. Yeah. And then you would have, to, uh, and uh, we, they, they, we did have a fair bit of infectious disease as well. Uh, in the form of um, uh, in our HIV patients, mm -hmm. including um, interesting stuff like uh, tox cerebral toxoplasmosis, cryptococcal pneumonia, crypt uh, meningitis, that sort of thing. So there, there's a wide variety of cases and pathologies available to us. However, uh, while this may be good clinically to a point in terms of experience, the resources for the appropriate management were another, was another story, mm. especially um, this was a part of this case as well, uh, which we, we will also see. For instance, um, MRI is not readily available in the public sector. So if uh, a patient needs an urgent MRI, you have to be pretty much damn sure you have a reason for it and then try to get it urgently. And if this can't be done, they usually have to pay out of pocket to try and get it done privately. Wow. So the healthcare system is supposed to be uh, free, more or less, but yeah. it does have a fair bit of challenges. Gotcha. And uh, can you share with us the um, social norms around approaching healthcare? What, what, how do people think of healthcare? Is there, what's the relationship between the, the average patient and the average healthcare provider? Oh, well, it, it, it varies a lot. There are some, some folks who would be you know, delighted and, and, and uh, you know, okay with the paternalistic view of medicine that, you know, uh, whatever you say, doctor, doctors know his best. Mm -hmm. But then the other folks might just be cantagorous, cantagorous and litigious with everything. Uh, then they're, they're, they're the folks that, that whose neighbors know more than the doctors do. So they would listen to, they would, you, you know, herbal medication and all that sort of random stuff is, is, is like a thriving thing there. Mm. So I've literally seen people come in with a sinus bradycardia from boiling some random tea, mm. uh, uh, some yellow flower at the side of the road that, that grows that actually has a digitalis-like effect, wow. things like that, yeah. That's incredible, wow. You certainly have a lot of clinical reps. That's, that's so cool. And is there a, is, and what, is the, what is the approach to pre preventative medicine or primary care? Is that something that a lot of people seek or is it more that you wait until you get sick before you seek care? They wait on, uh, many people wait until they, they get sick before they actually seek care. And the primary care is, system is rather burdened and we do feel the pinch of it in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the degree of complications that you see occurring in the secondary care setting. For instance, the amount of people with diabetic feet who go on to have amputations or, or the, um, the amount of people that go on to have end-stage renal disease and re uh, requiring dialysis and things like that. So it's quite high. And it was a real culture shock for me when I came to the UK and realized that, that hey, where, where are all the people with the diabetic feet or 
<laughs> all the folks requiring the dialysis and things like that. And you realize, it's, you know, the primary care system and the, the support structures that are in place, uh, you, you can actually tangibly see it working. That's incredible. That's so cool. You've literally seen it before your eyes. You know, we'll put yeah. it back to the case, but I see that Gabby has shared an incredible pearl from her neurological practice in Brazil. Um, Gabby, are you able to unmute and share it so that the folks listening to the recording can all learn from this really important pearl? If not, no worries at all. Oh, there you go. Hi. Can you hear me well? Hi. Yeah, uh, yeah so sorry, I cannot turn on my camera right now. Uh, what I wrote on the chat was that uh, it's very tricky to examine the eyes uh, since <laughs> if we try to focus on one eye and we have the both eye of the patient, the patient uh, not occluded, we are, at least I am going to feel confused. So uh, I feel it's, it's easier to occlude one of the eyes and test each cranial nerve from that side and then do the same uh, with the other eye uh, because when we test the two eyes together uh, like in this video we are going to test the conjugate uh, gaze um, so this patient for example if he doesn't have a lesion on the cranial nerve six the ab abducent eye if we occlude in the video he cannot look with the both eye to the left right uh, so if we occlude one of his eyes and if we ask the, the person to look, uh, to abduct the eye, if the cranial nerve six uh, is not impaired, he's going to be able to look to the left. And if we test the conjugate case with the two eyes not occluded, uh, he will not be able to look to the left. <laughs> so I think uh, what I do is that uh, I usually test one eye each time, all the cranial nerves, and then test the both eye together. I feel it's easier to localize, even though I particularly find very difficult to localize uh, everything related to cranial nerves, especially the eyes. Uh, and yeah, I think that, that that's what I'm trying to say. I, uh, I hope I was clear. <laughs> All, as always, my friend, Pearl's coming to you from Trinidad, Ireland, and now Brazil. This is this is so cool. All right, Chris, do you want to give us some more information and take us where? Oh you're yeah, going? sure, certainly. Uh, so apart from from um, from this bit, which we we thought going on in the cranial nerves, you also had a right hemiplegia medical research council graded four out of five on the right upper and lower limb. Normal reflexes essentially. Plantars were flexor downgoing and a sensory exam that was actually normal throughout. And this is just a brief summary of, of um, <laughs> the, the, uh, what was actually done, but yeah. So we, we've come to this point uh, trying to answer where is in the, the lesion in fact. So the brainstem basically, just to, to reiterate, comprises of the midbrain at the topmost, the pons in the middle, and the medulla oblongata underneath. So I'll be using Peter Gates's rule of four approach to localize it. And uh, I just want to say a little bit of Professor Peter Gates, is a, a professor in neurology in Geelong in Australia. And he actually proposed the Gates's rule of four. It's published in the, uh, in the practical neurology Journal 2011, I was actually published before that in BMG in 2005. And I find it a, a, a quite a useful way of trying to simplify things a bit. So without further ado, so the first rule, there are four structures in the midline that start with M, pretty simple. There are four structures to the side or laterally that start with S. And the lowest four cranial nerves are in the medulla. So that's 12, 11, 9, and 10. In the middle four are in the pons. So that's where they originate from. That's 8, 7, 6, and 5. And the first four are above the pons with cranial nerves 3 and 4 from the midbrain. And cranial nerves 1 and 2 are not in the brainstem at all. The four cranial nerves that are in the midline all divide evenly into 12. So that's three, four, six, and 12. 
So using this information, we'll construct a model. So it's basically creating a 2D model, simplified 2D from a 3D structure. So just bear that in mind. We like to start with this three by three grid, add left and right orientations, medial and lateral. So the topmost represents midbrain pons, and then we have the medulla. So using the rule of four, so the medial structures, the structures in the midline, we'll add these cranial nerve nuclei. So we have three and four in the midbrain, six in the pons, and 12 in the medulla. Now with this information, we could add in the rest of the cranial nerve nuclei. So we have seven, five and eight, nine, 10, and we came to 11. Now you, you might notice 11 in red, and that's really to simplify it, we'll be removing it because the upper the roots of the cranial nerve 11 actually stem from the upper bit of the spinal cord. And that's why. So the other structures that begin with M that we'll be adding in, in the medial bit, uh, the medial longitudinal fasciculus, which is actually the most heavily, heavily myelinated structure in the nervous, in the central nervous system, and is responsible for the eyes being yoked together, uh, basically moving in the same direction when you look, look left and right. Lesions to this region cause what we call an internuclear ophthalmoplegia, which um, ipsilaterally, the, if it's affected, the ipsilateral eye cannot adduct, but the contralateral eye adducts, uh, abducts, sorry, but with nystagmus. We have the motor pathway, which is pretty much the corticospinal tract, the medial lemniscus, which carries vibration and position sense. So we'll now add these. So our lateral structures, we have the sympathetic pathway injury to which will cause a Horner syndrome. Spinothalamic pathway, which injury to which can cause contralateral loss of pain and light touch. The sensory portion of cranial nerve five injury will cause facial numbness on that side. And the spinocerebellar pathway, which may be responsible for arm or leg ataxia. So adding these in, medial and lateral. So now we will just fill in the middle and inferior cerebellar peduncles. Not forgetting the substantia nigra in the midbrain and the parapont paramedian pontine reticular formation, which is responsible for initiating horizontal gaze. So those structures are there. So almost there, we have the arterial supply of the brainstem now. So we have the posterior cerebral artery, the basal artery, superior cerebellar artery, anterior inferior cerebellar artery, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, and the anterior spinal artery. And the, this is basically the rough arterial supply. So we'll try it out now with a few examples and we'll get back to our case. So we'll start with the Wallenberg syndrome. And these are some of its clinical features highlighted in red being the structures involved. So dysphagia, so we know cranial nerves nine and 10 are involved. The nausea, vertigo, nystagmus, we know it's cerebellar. Ipsilateral facial numbness, we know it's cranial nerve five. And spinothalamic tract for contralateral numbness, ipsilateral ataxia, and possibly ipsilateral Horner syndrome. So if we were to input this into our model, so we know this here, nine and 10, or cerebellar signs, and the tracks that are involved from the other symptoms. So we can see that most of these problems are existing in the lateral medulla, the arterial supply being the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, 
and this is called the lateral medullary syndrome. Now, I just want to point out that the cranial, the tracts that are usually involved are generally at the level of the cranial nerves that are affected. So for instance, the sympathetic tract or spinothalamic tract affected would be at that particular level. So it, it's not going to be higher up. I mean, it's possible like anything in medicine, but that would be rather unusual. So we will just try another example. So we have the Dejerine syndrome, which is characterized by ipsilateral tongue paralysis, contralateral weakness, and contralateral vibration and position loss. And these are the structures involved. So we have cranial nerve 12, corticospinal tract for the weakness, and loss of position sensor vibration. So we know it's in the medial medulla, part of the medulla, with the blood supply being the anterior spinal artery. And this is the medial medullary syndrome. Another example, we have the marie Foix syndrome, which is essentially ipsilateral facial paralysis, deafness and tinnitus, contralateral body numbness, ipsilateral Horner syndrome, Ipsilateral ataxia, nausea, vomiting, vertigo, and ipsilateral loss of facial pain and temperature. So where would these go based on this based on these structures involved? So we know that it's in the lateral bonds because we've just highlighted which structures are involved based on this, the signs and symptoms. And that's the superior cerebellar artery and or in, in anterior inferior cerebellar artery supply or territory. And that's the lateral pontine syndrome. One more example, Weber syndrome. So this is uh, highlighted by ptosis, diplopia, a dilated pupil, and contralateral hemiplegia. So we know that the structures involved would therefore be cranial nerve three and the corticospinal tract. So in cranial nerve three is in the midbrain and the corticospinal tract at that level. So we know that it's, a, um, it's in the midbrain and the supply is the posterior cerebral artery. Bearing in mind that, that the, the, the degree of symptoms or what's experienced clinically is dependent on, on how, how large the lesion might be, because there are instances of Weber syndrome also presenting with a Parkinsonian type features if the, if the substantia nigra is involved. So back to our patient. So we noted that he had a left seven, cranial nerve seven lower motor neuron weakness. We thought he had a, a left horizontal conjugate called gaze palsy and right hemiplegia. So cranial nerve seven, that localizes to the pons. It's a, it might seem a little odd that it's a lower as opposed to an upper, but I'll come to that in a short bit. We think that um, his paramedian pontine reticular formation was affected uh, as well, given his ability to look to the left at all. And well, corticospinal tract involvement with the right hemiplegia. So if we were to input this into our model, you get something like this. So we think this is a medial pontine syndrome, the ter arterial territory being the basilar artery. So let's solve this clinical problem. This is just a cross section of where I, I thought the, the lesion was uh, how, what was happening at the time. Now, as you can see here, the, we have the cranial nerve seven, a bit lateral to the cranial nerve six, but from the nucleus, the, the nerve actually exits and wraps around cranial nerve six, and then comes out and exits. So the reason I postulated that he had a cranial nerve, lower motor cranial nerve seven as a to an upper was because it was affected at the level of the pons, but after the nerve was affected after leaving the nucleus. Of course, the degree of weakness would be dependent on how much of the corticospinal tract might be involved from the initial lesion. 
So this is Fauville syndrome, generally characterized by ipsilateral facial paralysis, paralysis of conjugate gaze to the side of the lesion, contralateral hemiplegia. And these were some of this guy's investigation summarized. His chest X-ray ECG was fine. And his CT scan of the head non-contrast was when he came in because this was sudden with cranial nerve neuropathies and right-sided weakness. It was it, it, um, no abnormalities, but I think we can all agree that CT is not the best imaging modality for posterior fossa structures. In that case, you need an MRI, which unfortunately this gentleman had to pay for and he got uh, more than 24 hours after his initial presentation and confirming an infarction of the left inferior ferromedial pons. Um, this is a diffusion um, picture of the, his diffusion weighted MRI. The highlighted area here that's a bit hyper intense is the area of infarction. And it's exactly where we postulated it to be based on our, our uh, uh, going through the neuroanatomy of the structures involved. So Fauville syndrome, it's basically a brainstem lesion characterized by crossed paralysis and it's crossed because it's occurring on one side of the face and then another side of the body. Of course, Weber syndrome being another and there are various other eponym eponyms for these Benedict syndrome. Uh, uh, you can probably write a whole book on those paranoid Etiologies would include infarction, hemorrhage, uh, rarely tuberculoma, and space occupying lesions. And there will be a degree of variability in clinical presentation depending on the size of on cytotoxic edema surrounding the lesion, things like that. You may present with ipsilateral conjugate gaze palsy with fifth, sixth, or seventh and contralateral hemiparesis. And it may, if it includes a cranial nerve gate, include deafness. Horner syndrome if the sympathetic tract is involved and facial hypoesthesia. So in summary, we basically visualizing the brainstem using Peter Gates's rule of four. And uh, who, who, uh, you use this to solve our current, our clinical problem. So maybe before, you, you might have been like this, but, uh, you know, hopefully now, uh, maybe a little bit more like that. <laughs> Amazing. This is so, so, so. Oh, uh, folks are, by the way, I don't know, uh, Chris, we're just getting to know each other. Um, yeah. I have no idea who people are from popular culture, but I'm told this is Drake, which is really, really cool. I learned the four rules of Bates, Gates, and now I know Drake. This is amazing. Well, uh, to be honest, well, I, I didn't know who that was. Until oh, Chris, you know, I love you so much more now. I think we're actually yeah. like much, much tighter. Can I ask you a couple of questions? So um, okay. what can you can you give us a sense of um, what the cost of that MRI is? Like, when you say he, that he so, paid out. So it depends in the private sector. It's usually between anywhere between four and five thousand TT dollars. The exchange rate to U.S. would be approximately one U.S. is about six point seven TT dollars. It's incredible, and it took twenty four hours to make it happen. Wow. Yeah, it, it, or, or even even a, maybe a bit more. But, but uh, there's a thriving private sector and a distinctly not so great public sector. Yeah, you know, um, I, I think that your uh, your teaching and the way you um, shared with us the lessons you've learned about brainstem localization are absolutely amazing. And I think um, for me, I have to watch this over and over again. But I know it's a template to simplify it going forward. Another big lesson that I learned was how inelegant it can be because of the, the phenomenon of cytotoxic edema. That's another really cool pearl to add in there. And edema is probably inconsequential uh, in many places, but given how cramped this area is, I imagine it can be significantly consequential. Yeah, and so yeah. My, yeah, my takeaways are, I'm in a patient who presents with an abrupt onset peripheral nerve, peripheral cranial nerve seven palsy that's in the brainstem until proven otherwise, which is a great pearl. Um, and I also learned um, a little bit about the social cultural dimensions in, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago about access to care and um, 
uh, and yellow leaves causing the house toxicity. And I learned to dive deeper into the Beit Shul of Fo, which is absolutely incredible. I um, I know Ravi had some reflections to share with you about your journey and how um, you've now moved on to a different part of the world. So I'll pass the mic to him to um, reflect on that dimension. Uh, sure. Thanks, Ravi. Um, yeah, Chris, I just want to ask, like, uh, what, moving from Trinidad and Tobago, which is in, on this side of the hemisphere, what made you move to Northern Ireland, which is uh, a whole different sort of a, a place? Was there some culture shock too, or how do you adapt to that? So how, what was what prompted you to make the move? And then also, how do you adapt to that climate and I guess the culture of Northern Ireland? So uh, I knew from, from, from when I was working in internal medicine that I wanted to pursue neurology. Since there are no programs available in the Caribbean for specialization in the proper way of this part, then my, my exams were essentially British being the Royal College of Physicians exams. I had to pursue it in the UK. But the logistics of things at that time was such that there was a resident labor market test in place. This is just prior to Brexit. And that meant that, that uh, a local in any competitive specialty for, for training, a local would, would be given preference over a foreigner in terms of getting that spot. Brexit changed that a little bit. So in order to, to, um, to basically stand out a bit more, I decided to complete the, their specialty certificate exams before actually doing the training in order to, to increase my chances of being selected for a program. And then Brexit, basically, when that happened, it meant that everybody, uh, foreigners and locals, were on the same playing field. So it made things a little bit easier in terms of moving. The reason that I started off in acute medicine in Enniskillen on this part of Ireland is because I, would, I was transitioning from a relatively lower technologically, uh, less maybe less sophisticated system to the NHS, which, it would, which would have been different, a, a culture shock for me. So it was strategic in the sense that the cost of living on this side of the UK is much less compared to mainland England. And it, the pace might be a little bit slower. Plus, by starting off in acute medicine, I would get dive right into all their protocols, pathways, referral systems, without going straight into the specialty of my choice and being a burden of now having to prove myself by adapting to this change. So I've done, uh, so I've I've come on this side first to 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 make that adaptation and to build my curriculum BT uh, and um, everything else that might be needed to strengthen an application for the training process. And that's basically how I ended up on this part. Uh, awesome to know that. And is it? I guess people always hear from in the United States talk about how in England it's very heavy on physical physical examination, less on technology, and you probably see that you have more access to MRIs and CT scans there. But do they still emphasize now with the new technology? Still emphasize the classic teaching of uh, physical examination, bedside uh, techniques, and so on. I would I would say I won't paint all with the same brush. I, I'm sure there, there would be areas that emphasize more on investigation, but if you're a little bit more old school, like um, like how I would have trained, then, then there, there's a structure or a pattern to follow. There's history, physical exam, and then, then you move on to your investigations. You have, a, you have to justify and have a reason for why, why you're doing things. So I will give them that. You can't just you know order something without a, a, a pretty good reason so it is I would say to, to, to an extent dependent on on your clinical ability first but I think this is something that across the board is disappearing in the health system globally that's absolutely true yeah we, we do suffer with that over here too but 
there is a big movement to go to get back to the bedside and learn classical uh, examination techniques. So can you tell me a bit about now, like how we all met or Shiva, who's not here, but uh, you started uh, or your training there. Uh, usually, do you have lecture based training or I saw that you had your first morning report uh, out Southwest Hospital. And is that uh, successful? Is that up and running now? Yeah. Um, so the thing is, uh, they, unfortunately, the, the hospital is generally re relatively understaffed. That particular hospital, because it's relatively new, the the middle grade doctors or anybody between consultant and and uh, ju very junior, that 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 base is lacking to a large extent. So it's very difficult to get people to present uh, in, in, in terms of a, a, at an educational level. When I start, started, I took up the role of uh, associate college tutor for the Royal College of Physicians. And um, that, so I, I took a greater part in clinical education and I also taught uh, uh, undergraduate students as well. And because of that, it was Shiva's idea to implement a morning report. Now, I did have this case prepared from before, and um, the aim was to try and get some form of publishing in to help strengthen my applications. But he thought, why not turn it into an educational uh, venture? And that this is basically how we ended up, um, uh, ended up doing this bit and starting. In acute medicine, it's very difficult sometimes to have lecture-based teaching. A lot of the work is opportunistic in the sense that I would have, if I have a, a medical students with me, I would show them what's available. This is what we have and teach on it. If I'm on the take in the emergency room, I would carry them with me and, and, and show them what, what we do and how we approach things. So, but if there's time for a very scheduled lecture-based teaching, then we, we, we also do those. But I can't say that. It sometimes is very difficult to meet everybody's schedules and time demands. Awesome. And um, if anybody else have any questions, please type type it in the chat. But I'm sort of going to switch gears here. We we do here at CPS like to talk about food. And now, what would you say you is your favorite food in Trinidad and Tobago? And I know uh, I saw in a documentary they grow some of the uh, uh, hottest spices in Trinidad. I think one of the <laughs> world's hottest spices found in Trinidad. Uh, and how would you compare that to dishes in Northern Ireland? Like, what is your favorite dish in Northern Ireland? Yeah, so that was a, a bit of a culture shock um, for, for, for me. But uh, from Trinidad, we, our food is generally multi, multicultural. For instance, I would have grown up eating more fun of uh, Indian type food, roti and dal and that sort of thing. And that, that sort of thing. But uh, over here, um, the spice is not quite spicy. And, it's it's a bit different, maybe a, a bit less salt and and that sort of thing. But I I, I can't say that I have a, a favorite food. It, it depends on really what the what what you feel like having on that day. So I do like, for instance, sushi and other things as well. I do like my authentic Indian food, or Thai, or or even pasta and that sort of thing. So I can't say that I have a favorite. Yeah, I know uh, the, the British palate, I guess, has adjusted with uh, the influx of immigrants. So they've adopted, I know, uh, chicken tikka masala is now an official British Oh, oh dish, that, that's but, everywhere. I was yeah. surprised. When, when yeah, we, I do yeah. miss my uh, fish and chips, though. And yeah. uh, going up to Scotland, uh, I guess, haggis I've tried, which uh, is a delicacy up there. Yeah, yeah, I've tried that. Interesting. Oh, I see Reza has joined us. Hey, Reza. Um, so any other um, stories or anything else, Chris, you'd like to share with us about your time in uh, Northern Ireland? Well, I, I did have a very interesting case um, that uh, in November last year was basically a 60 year old gentleman who presented with a rapidly progressive neurodegenerative con condition. So he, 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 a dementia like process, he was extremely forgetful. He was fine six months prior to that. And, um, you know, his wife is just telling me that, that you now he, he's reached a point where he's not walking, he's not talking. And when I went in to look at this guy, he had these very um, brisk myoclonic jerks of his upper limbs. 
he had an exaggerated startle response called hyperplexia when as soon as I opened the door, he jumped. He could speak only one word, but he can't speak. It's, it's just that to a large extent, he's not doesn't doesn't want to, if that's the right word. So I thought it was in line with what we call akinetic mutism. And uh, his scans from six months before was actually completely normal. When we repeated it, uh, based on the, these findings with the rapidly progressive dementia, uh, myoclonic jerks, a possible akinetic mutism and exaggerated startle, I considered a Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease type picture of prion disorder. So we did get an MRI that, that confirmed that, that that was actually the case. Um, it, 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 it pretty much matches. And the, the, the thing is, in, in, and this is really was a, a landmark case for me as to why I decided to leave acute medicine, is that um, the, we, with, with this particular case, we had to call another specialty, the, the neurology team in uh, the regional team to, to take over management or okay. care. And uh, the, of course they accepted, but then the, you, you know it meant that this was not something that I would have been able to pursue that I would have wanted to. It turns out that the guy, because of a lack of bed space in the tertiary center, he, he stayed on the ward and uh, I, I phoned up the, the regional center and, and followed their advice on ex in doing an entire autoimmune paraneoplastic encephalopathy screen. I did the lumbar puncture to exclude the, the, the prion protein, but I think because some due to some issues that remained a bit inconclusive. And unfortunately, the, the, um, the gentleman uh, passed away on the ward. He ended up aspirating and got septic and, and then ended up dying. Uh, but it, it was a very, it, it's something that you only read in textbooks because I think the, it's, it's something like one in a million over here. And it was very unique and interesting to deal with it firsthand and to see what it's like. In, but but um, I, I did not uh, particularly fancy the bit about him not being able to follow up afterward what what's happening what's the end result what are the rest of the investigations yeah absolutely yeah if you dive deep into uh, british medical history there was an outbreak i think in the late 80s of cjd and uh, they had to mass exterminate uh, uh, cows oh. out there so i think it's it's less now but uh, definitely yeah. I, it's something i've not seen here and terribly terrible terminal illness uh so thanks for bringing up that case i don't think we'll probably ever see that here uh although the odd case may may spring up here and there but uh any other questions for chris as we're getting close to the end of the hour oh chris i wanted to ask you something um sure. i feel I don't, I feel inadequate asking this question after Chris and Robbie just have like the best accents ever. Now, <laughs> my, me, like I'm sounding so bland. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask you because I feel like moving places and moving to places as different as you did and training in two different locations, very different. Um, you know, we you talked a little bit about that cultural shock, but um, do you have like any advice for people going through that? Because like one of my main goals in this lifetime is to like experience as many cultural shocks as possible. Um, that is that that's gonna be in my CV tonight. That's like my hobby. Um, but you know. It all depends where you're going from and where you're going, like where you come from and where you're going through. And then like any advice for people going through different cultural shocks? I would have to say you, you keep the, the, um, the, the goal or what you have to accomplish in mind. You keep an open mind about where you're going. Try to understand from the other person's shoes or, um, or, or you know, how they must they, they think. Try not to make any assumptions or jump to conclusions uh, about things, but you generally just keep focused and have thick skin when you have to. 
because only you are responsible for your 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 destiny. And don't let other people get in the way of that. I've had my my share of challenges over here as well. Um, I think it, it's a it it, it, it was different I, and even in sort of rural I Ireland really patients are very nice but you know there they have been one or two uh, um, not so pleasant experiences where where you are looked at as a foreigner and uh, uh, but you know you you you're there for you you just have to keep in mind that you are there for a reason you have a mission you have a goal that you need to accomplish and Everything else is just dust in the wind. Yeah, I really like that reflection. I think it's very helpful. And like the counterpart of experiencing cultural shocks and different, um, you know, new experiences, how do you, how do you stay true to yourself? Like, how do you remind yourself of everything you've gone through? Because when when I left Trinidad, I, I put it forward to my family and I literally put uh, said that um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this book called The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And I know it's a, a lot of people say, throw it out there like the popular thing to do. But if you really read it, it um, the, the, there's one, uh, one chapter that says you must put your soldiers on death ground meaning that if you leave yourself no exit or no other option, you would fight as hard as you can to do what you came to, to pretty much do what you came to do. When I came here, I gave up a shot at being a consultant because I, I was not interested in the title, I was not interested in position, I was interested in self-actualizing and doing what, what I came to do so that when, when, I, when I get old and ready to retire or, 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 or on my deathbed, I can look back on the rest of my life and say that I did what I was supposed to do and have no regrets about anything. And I knew that if I did not leave, I would have regretted because I would have always looked back and, say, and, and told myself, what if, and asked that question, what if? So you, you just have to get the, the, to think ahead how you are going to feel and not to live in a way that you have to ask yourself, what if? Not to live in a way to have fear or anxieties. You're doing the best you can and you, you, you push forward and always keep fighting forward. Wow. That's pretty much what I did. Just what Reza said, Reza's like chills. First of all, you know, there's two types, like there's three types of people in the world. People who don't read classics, People who read classics because they're classics, that's me, just so I can say like I read it. And then there's people like you, people who read classics and then internalize it. And then you come up with these reflections that I don't think um, anybody else in the world would have given us that exact response. And I found um, it, yeah. You, yeah. I'm sure you are unique, unique in your own right and have coming from Guatemala would have faced your own challenges and made it this far. So it, it's not cl reading classics for, for, for its sake. I'm sure you would have internalized some uh, uh, much of it, even if you're not overtly conscious of it, it, it becomes part of you. You're right. Everything becomes part of ourselves. Like everything becomes ourselves, right? Everything we read, everything we eat, everything we dance, everybody we meet, just they have like a, a footprint in ourselves and it's I really like how you reflected on, on on doing that journey right a lot of people um do that journey and it's something that I've struggled with how my identity and like my dreams are not geographically located um and I yeah I, I think I'll have to hear that your words again because yeah. uh, they become truer the more you hear them yeah, I think we all have to, to just remember that being a doctor does not define who we are completely. It's just a part of our complex identity as being a human. So it's important to encompass and, and encourage the growth of all aspects of your or facets of your identity and uh, not just that, that bit of it. Agreed. Totally agreed. And in that case, like, Last question, just because you seem like such an interesting 
uh, person, Chris, but like, how would you introduce yourself? As you say, like being a doctor is not your complete identity. What things have we missed uh, during the hour? No, oh, I'm, I'm just me. I'm just a person, a guy from the Caribbean trying to pursue neurology. And that's all. And, um, I'm here today, will be gone tomorrow, just like everybody else. Small, small person on a small rock in a very huge universe. Yeah. But in that time, yeah. You, you're doing the best you can and you're trying to learn something every day. Agreed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's chilling. <laughs> it's chilling how small we are, but like, and how, you know, you came from the Caribbean, you're in the UK, you met Robbie, who is also trained in the UK, came to Baltimore. Rafa was in Baltimore a couple of days ago, he's now in Brazil, and now they're all here. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm very mm -hmm. thankful to have this experience with uh, a lot of people from all over the world and how we move. Thankfully, things move um, and we move and we never know where, we're, where we'll end up. Um, mm -hmm. we, ne we never know, right? Uh, but it's important to stay open um, to, to the opportunities life gives us. Um, I'm very thankful to have uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting you uh, today. I don't know if anybody else has any questions. Uh, I just have one comment. Yeah, it, this, this sort of just was put together last night. So me and Maria was texting and uh, trying to get this going, but this has just been incredibly powerful. Chris, uh, you, is, you are so deep and profound uh, with your reflections. It's just amazing uh, at, at your age, you have such a wisdom. I just want to chime in on that. And Definitely, you've you've moved me, and uh, I feel like I want to come over to Northern Ireland and and give you a hug and uh, or group hug with everyone. But uh, uh, it's definitely gonna gonna I'm gonna think about this today, and uh, hopefully when Shiva gets back, uh, we can do this again, and uh, hopefully uh, learn some more neurology with a case that you guys may have. Uh, uh, well, thanks a lot for having me. I, I know Shiva is not here, but on his behalf. I'm sure we, we are both honored to be part of tonight's proceedings and I appreciate the opportunity to connect and, and um, be part of this, uh, this, this session and you know, hopefully we'll have more interactions in the future. Uh, hey everyone, um, Chris, I just wanted to say a quick thank you. Rafa told me to say a few words and when Rafa tells you to speak, you speak. Um, that was such an epic exchange between you and Maria which is all preceded by some stellar teaching in neurology. And hopefully we can get that segment of the interview on our podcast for our 50 to 60,000 people to listen to because it was true poetry. And I just want to tag along with what Ravi said. I don't see any alopecia or gray hair. So I'm not sure where you got all this wisdom from, but you are decades ahead, my friend. Thank you for sharing your insight. I would have to say just apart from medicine, I, I also like to read a lot of a lot of odd stuff maybe books and uh, philosophies uh, from all sorts of parts of the world i love that i define myself as a new soul there's people who are old souls and i feel chris is an old soul i feel i'm a new mm -hmm. soul and so the title of the podcast can just be like old soul teaches new soul <laughs> medicine and non-medicine <laughs> but yeah um, thank you, Chris. Uh, we, yeah, it was really quite an honor and I'll need to internalize this conversation soon. Please come back. There, please come to Tuesday as well. There, on Tuesdays, we do neuro VMRs, but whenever you want, um, hopefully you'll find a family in all of us. Um, of course, sir. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I'll be happy to join. Uh, just uh, once I can make it to you, just uh, send, send me on a link then. When I can, I'll be involved. Definitely. So everybody, uh, thank you so much for coming. I know we changed dates and this uh, was planned last minute, but as you see, Chris, Chris's uh, wisdom needed to be shared with the rest of all of you. Um, so thanks for everybody who joined us. Um, hope to see you guys soon. All right, Bye thank you. Bye. Have a good day.